All righty, so you are Mr. Sam Bush. You're an award-winning bluegrass musician. How are you, sir? Doing great. Doing good. Doing great. I, I, can... I woke up today, so that's been a very positive start. I, that's the right way to look at it. Um, me and Ethan are both honored to have you on here. Yes, sir. Um, I saw you this summer at the Blue Ridge Music Center. A lady named Tamara Sutton uh-huh. took me, and I was blown away by your show. I'd never heard of you before, and uh, it was just a great show, and I enjoyed it. And then we were looking for people to have on, so I contacted you, and uh, we're very excited to speak with you today. Well, my pleasure, Thank you. And, I, and I love a first impression, so I'm glad, uh, glad you enjoyed it for the first time. Absolutely. Well, we always start off with the same question. Where did you grow up? Okay. Well, I grew up on a tobacco and cattle farm out about seven miles outside of Bowling Green, Kentucky. So Bowling Green is like down in your south central part of the state. So it's, mm-hmm. I didn't grow up in the in you know in the coal mining hills or any of that stuff. No, but I did grow up as a as a farming kid and. Um, um, our mother worked at Sears and they, so there were five kids and, uh, but grew up outside Bowling Green and, um, and was fortunate to grow up in a musical family. It just in that my parents really loved music. They were, they were not, yeah. certainly weren't musicians for a living or anything. Again, my dad was a farmer. My mother worked at Sears and, uh, but they were a farm couple and, uh, encouraged. So my mom played the guitar some dad on the fiddle and mandolin. And, uh, and they, so they encouraged us kids to get off the farm and do something different. They didn't want us to, I I think they didn't want us to work as hard as they did. And, you know, we didn't as none of us were farmers. Did you ever have that desire to work on a farm? Um, I've thought about that. And basically I started playing mandolin when I was 11 and then fiddle by age 13. So the music was kind of leading me in that direction. But I've often realized that probably if if I hadn't have you know had if I wasn't musically inclined, probably would have been a farmer. I mean that's uh, I don't know that that may well have been what would have happened. Um, we see a lot of artists dabbling in other aspects of art too. Were you very artistic as a child in other sense that were non musical, like drawing or painting? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, um, no. I mean, you know, took art class though in high school, but uh, no, uh, but uh, it, it um, but the, the music just, you know, it, it, it's hard to say what, you know, what attracted you to this music or that. I know in, in terms of the kind of fiddle and mandolin, my two main instruments, um, that that's what I grew up hearing my father play in like, uh, records by a, uh, a fiddle player named Tommy Jackson, who was the Grand Ole Opry fiddler. So we grew up, uh, by growing up close to Nashville, I didn't realize until I was already grown and gone from home that uh, what an advantage it was for us because we lived in cr- close proximity of Nashville, Tennessee uh, television, 55 miles north of Nashville. So I literally grew up watching some of the greatest, you know, pickers I would ever see. I got to watch how their hands moved because there were Grand Ole Opry shows that would come on locally on these Nashville channels. So I got to watch the great mandolin players such as Bill Monroe, uh, Jesse McReynolds from Jim and Jesse and Bob Osborne from the Osborne brothers. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, I was growing up in the generation where the Ed Sullivan show was on and I saw all of the Beatles performances on Ed Sullivan. You know, the young Rolling Stones were on then and, and, uh, you know, I got to see acts like the doors and the Jefferson airplane. So I got, uh, but watching TV before there was such a thing as learning videos as there is now on on instruments and hopefully, Mm -hmm. uh, Though watching TV was a great learning guide for me, just getting to watch how the musicians' hands moved and how they worked was a great learning guide for me. So, and uh, and 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 growing up in the '60s, uh, it, um, there were so many kinds of music all on the public airwaves at once. You would you would hear everything from the psychedelic bands of of the day, like Jefferson Airplane, or you'd hear the Beatles, or there was an act at the time called the Singing Nun. So the Singing Nun had had a hit record uh, at the same time, and 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 um, it, it, there there weren't as many 
c categories, I guess, for music as, but, but again, you'd hear the singing nun and then you'd hear one of the greatest ever, Aretha Franklin, you know, so there, or, or you, you still got to, and, and we got to see the Beatles on TV. So that was a pretty uh, marvelous time to get to hear music. Uh, you mentioned your art class you took in high school. Were there any music or band classes that you participated in? And did they kind of shape your music style or were they boring maybe? Uh, yes, I was fortunate that uh, we uh, had Band, you know, there was a, a, high, a marching band, a high school band, and also what you would call not an orchestra, but what you call stage band when you were, you know, playing in, in for your assemblies and stuff. So I was fortunate that um, our band director was a guy named George Mills. And uh, Mr. Mills is, was, was a wonderful influence and a very positive influence on us. And there weren't many natural musicians. In, and it was, a, it was you know, a small uh, ensemble. It, was a large, it got to be a large school, but there was still only ever about 45 people in the band. But I got to be in the band. And, and so I played drums in the, drum in the marching band, uh, bass drum one year, snare drum another. Uh, and, but Mr. Mills also um, had actually worked with my mother at Sears and he knew I had some talent for music. And uh, he got to school to buy a bass fiddle, a bass wow. violin. A ba and Mr. Mills was a cello player. It was his no, most natural instrument. So at any rate, he gave me bass lessons. And uh, so I had to really hone down on it and learn to read uh, the bass clef uh, for, the, for the bass violin. So I played the bass violin in the stage band and drums in the marching band. And, uh, and marching band was a great, uh, a great education and great discipline. Uh, right. No messing around. <laughs> one one, you, go, you go one step too far and you've messed up the whole formation, <laughs> as I know. And um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, marching band. And then there was what was called mixed chorus. So boys and girls, okay. uh, the, the, yeah. the high school chorus. So I got to, I was a mixed chorus for two or three years, I guess three years, uh, two years in the band. But I will say um, when, when I was playing the, the bass fiddle in the school orchestra, the school stage band, Mr. Mills was a great influence because he, he recognized that I was being a little shy on my instrument. And, and so he'd, yeah. when he'd solo me in front of the rest of the band, it would be incredibly intimidating. And he, yeah. and he told me, he gave me a great bit of advice is that, he said, it, your playing sounds like you're trying to avoid a mistake rather than to actually play your instrument. So you got to you got to change that because it's going to always sound that way if you don't correct that. And he said, if you make a mistake, make a really big one in front of everybody and probably you won't do that again. You might make a different mistake, <laughs> but you won't make that one again. So it was Mr. Mills that encouraged me to quit quit, you know, horsing around and, and hit it and play with authority and, and sure. you know, learn, learn to play your instruments with authority. So uh, George Mills was a great influence. So my high school band director was one of my most positive influences. Absolutely. Um, you, in a lot of your music, you do a lot of vocals. Did you have that talent very early on for singing? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that, no. Uh, but uh, Well, I, I could always, I, I could hear harmony, the harmony parts and and uh, sing harmony easily. And when I say hear it, it's that um, it wasn't until I got in high school band and, and needed to learn to read music to that I came up with, when you come from a world of country or folk music, it's generally learned, and rock and roll too, it's, it's learned by ear. You, you, just, you learn it because you hear it. You didn't really learn to read music and necessarily become educated in the instrument. But I, but I, uh, I, I, I learned to, to read music. And so the discipline of all that was just one of the, one of the, one of the most important things that, was, uh, that I ever did. But for singing, I kind of, uh, my sisters were the singers and I would, had two sisters that sang. So I would kind of maybe, maybe grab a harmony part sometime. But I, um, uh, I, I started singing lead in bluegrass style bands when I was about 19 out of necessity. Uh, we had another singer that we both sang lead, but then when he quit, um, we honestly, we, we weren't finding anyone any better than me to do it. So I just did it. 
And uh, so I always thought of myself as an instrumentalist that also sang when, in fact, now I can actually, when, when I look at the, the way our show is, of course, there's there's about, there would be maybe three instrumentals in the show and yep. the rest is vocals. So I don't always realize that what I am, that I am also a singer for a living. So, you know, yep. And uh, you, you, singing, singing was always a little more intimidating than playing when I was a kid. I had a pretty weak voice, and I've had to work really hard to make it uh, project yeah. and learn to do that. Uh, you, you, you mentioned high school earlier. Were you very academic in school? Well, I carried books, you know, in classes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tell you what now, and this is not always easy to admit, but when I was in school, uh, I, I I got so over by the time I was in high school, having mm -hmm. had again start started playing mandolin at age eleven and fiddle around thirteen. By the time I got to high school, I was so engrossed. My my mind was so occupied with music, and it didn't matter what kind. I just you know the, the, it, and it and to this day we'll still do that sometimes. It, like it. It just it invades my brain in the middle of a conversation. Perhaps all of a sudden I might think of a melody or think of some things, and and uh, my mind will actually lose itself in music. And um, all of a sudden I realize I'm I've, I've I'm, I'm lost in the conversation. Well, that happened to me a lot in high school. I would be so I'd be sitting in the classroom thinking about uh, that's all I could think about was music, and. Uh, be it the high school band arrangement we were going to play later or the rock and roll song that I was learning with the rock band I was in or the bluegrass song that I was learning that I was going to play in the bluegrass band I was in. And uh, teacher call on me and, and I'm just totally lost because I realized uh, my mind, my, my I guess my eyes are looking at him, but I, my mind went to music. So yeah. It's either a blessing or a curse, whichever way you look at it. I, I'd like to think it, it's been a good thing that yeah, music, yeah. Is, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm happy that it still, uh, it still invades my brain that much. I'll, you know, uh, my wife and I'll be having a conversation and she'll look down and see fingers moving on my left hand and going, are you working up something? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. But, but yeah, but so that, yeah. uh, Again, I, I, I'll think of it as a blessing that 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 was that's always occurred to me that uh, music just invades my brain. You mentioned playing shyly earlier. Have you ever had to public speak? And do you think? Well, obviously you've had to public speak, but do you think that your music, your instrumental work, and your vocal work has influenced your public speaking in some way? Maybe made you more comfortable with it or less comfortable? Well, with yes, with public speaking, that that too just came with, uh, you know, you call it the, the MC uh, of the yeah. show, the master of ceremony. Yeah. And uh, so I, I became the MC because, well, that quite frankly, so we, we, uh, we, the, the, the MC of the band left the band, leaving us without one. And so somebody had to do it. And, and, uh, and, and our banjo player, for instance, would always look at me and go, well, I'm not doing it. I don't care if anybody does it. <laughs> And, uh, okay, well, I guess I will. And um, so I had to learn to do that. And and that's that's where it's easiest to make the most mistakes, simply right. standing and talking over the mic uh, on, you know, when I'm singing a song, that's established. And when I'm playing my mandolin, that's established, you know, what I'm going to try to do. And, um, but public speaking, and again, so, so I've, the extent of my public speaking is, uh, now, of course, I will do like what, what is called uh, workshops, uh, mandolin right. workshops. And so most of that is talking and discussing things, and right. but demonstrating how, how you do it on the mandolin and what have yeah. you. So uh, in, in terms of public speaking, my, the majority of anything I would do related to public speaking is, is musically you know, inclined. So that, that's a pretty easy subject that I'm supposed to know something about. Uh, and, uh, but at any rate that, so that's, uh, but as, as an actual public speaker, I've had occasions where twice I was uh, asked to be the, uh, and a different person does it each year with the international bluegrass music association, um, award show. So twice I've, I've been the MC of the award show and, and, 
they've changed their format some now, but back when you first, when I was doing it, I've done it a couple of times, you literally had to come out and kind of, you're not doing, trying to do stand up comedy, but you're trying to, you know, come out, and welcome the people and talk for about five minutes. And that might not seem like much, but once you're standing on the stage, sure, by yourself, a long five, time. five minutes seems like a really long time. Yeah. We sure. take a class this summer on public speaking. And if you're just talking with somebody, five minutes goes by like that. But yeah. when everybody's looking at you, it's scary. It's, <laughs> it can it's drag tough. on a little bit. It can be intimidating. And, and it took me a while to uh, always go on with the attitude, you know, that people want to like it. The people came right. to the, came to the yeah. show with, with, you know, people came to like it. They didn't come not to like it. So, you know, try to join in that because it, yes, of course it can be intimidating, especially like, um, you know, there's different kinds of audiences that we play for. And sometimes uh, what we think of in the performing arts centers, the, 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 the nice auditoriums, you know, where people might pay a, pres- a subscription series to come in and, they're, they go to a lot of concerts, and, and those concerts could include, uh, you know, bluegrass, newgrass, folk, con- you know, classical music. So people yeah. come to hear that. And, and the, sometimes the, if the audience is really quiet and really listening, that can sort of be the most intimidating as, as you yeah. stand there, you're hoping to please the audience. Can you sense an audience, uh, the feeling and vibe that they're putting off from the stage? Yeah, you can. Yes, because I mean, and what we do, of course, our brand of of entertainment is really what mm-hmm. we we stand there and play and sing. And yes, I talk between songs, but uh, you know, it's not uh, in 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 the world of show business what we think of. And you know, seeing dancers with lots of bands now and what have you, dancers and light shows. Uh, sure. Our our uh, you know our ours is more of just you know stand there and play. So it's. It's uh, it's what I like to think of as like uh, creating a circle of uh, positive, a uh, circle of positive energy in the room, and then so well, obviously it has to start with me and the band, and uh, because again we when when we're playing well and we've and I've been fortunate to have been playing with some of these guys for a couple of them you know the drummer over twenty years now and so we have a really good groove and and uh, we feel that this feeling of timing really when yeah. it's, it's going. So when that circle of communication is good right off the bat, it's five piece band. So when mm-hmm. the five of us are playing uh, and, it, and it already, you know, within the first song, you kind of know if it's feeling good or not, yeah. then yes, w- uh, we feel that energy transmit to the audience. You, you can feel it. Now, it's, not, it's really nothing you can put your finger on or, or explain, but other than you feel this positive circle of energy going on in the audience. And so that's, uh, that's what we hope for. And, and hopefully that can, you can get that feeling quickly. Yeah. Can you sometimes lose an audience? Cause I remember when I saw you this summer, I forget which song it was, but y'all were getting really, really into it. And it's like you were playing with each other and it, it was really cool to see. And uh, it, I could tell y'all were enjoying the music as well. Can the audience kind of fade away sometimes and y'all start playing it with each other more? Well, for each other. Them fading, fading away. You mean like li- literally losing the audience? That did, did we? Or no, get, or getting in, enraptured in the music and forgetting about the audience. Uh <laughs> well, that happens to us a lot. I mean, that because yeah. again, because of the way we entertain, it is through playing and singing. So, the better, in one way, the better that we can lose ourselves in it and and let the music. It, it really does overtake you sometimes. And it's that's nothing you can explain or plan on. Uh, but um, I've always been fortunate that when it's time for the downbeat, when it's time to start playing, that uh, my thoughts sort of just sort of stay with go. They go to the music and stay there. And I'm yeah. fortunate that I might that I'm not thinking about any you know thing that's uh, that, that I that I didn't get done that day or a problem of the day or what have you that my mind can just channel music at that time. So obviously that when I think when that occurs for the better, then it's better for the audience too, that we're all now we're all getting on the same page. Can the unfamiliarity of a new venue kind of hamper that feeling or does it have an effect on you? Well, it can be, uh, you know, it's all different. And, uh, 
And again, you might not know because you might not know that venue. You, I might not know that at this venue, people are always very quiet and respectful and they're not going to be outgoing. Then if where, where you go into, like sometimes we play these big things, I call them stand up bars where there aren't really seats. And obviously more college age people are come to those shows because old folks like me don't want to stand up for three hours. And, uh, but um, so when in a stand up bar, you know, people are going to talk to each other more. They, you know, you're just, you're standing there with each other and everybody's having a good time. Maybe some are singing along, maybe some are dancing. Uh, and, and in that situation, it's kind of easier to feel the, the positive vibe because people are outgoing and they're yelling at you and they're yelling encouragement at you and stuff. Uh, so it, uh, it, it, sometimes you, you do have to kind of feel, feel the room as you as you first go through first so many numbers, but, uh, again, but always remember, you know, people came to dig it. Yeah. Right. Right. Has there ever been a venue where you haven't enjoyed playing at for maybe for the setup or the people, or have you just generally enjoyed them all? Or if you even want to ask that, you might want to be invited back. I yeah, yeah, oh. that's true. You may not want to answer that. <laughs> well, no, of, of course you've been to things that didn't work out. I mean, well, sure. for instance, you know, like long ago, the spirit, you know, I've been doing this a long time, fellas. And, uh, uh, you know, earlier earlier in life, uh, you, you're just out there struggling for people to notice you. Um there was uh, there there was a rock and roll star in the seventies named Leon Russell, so we became Leon's we a band called Newgrass Revival, which was a four piece bluegrass style group, uh, bluegrass newgrass. Um, <laughs> anyway, we became Leon's band for a while. Well, he was this big rock and roll star, and people yeah. didn't know uh, us at all. And yeah. so for the, the very first time we came out as we were his band for two years and he totally switched direction to use a band with bluegrass style instruments to play his rock and roll music. Well, we were the guys that could play that way. And it was a real high energy, fun show. I invite you to check it out sometime. Leon Russell and the, and the new grass revival. Okay. But anyhow, we, it was like being in a fifties rock band with bluegrass instruments, but his audience wasn't ready for us at all. So he and we were to go out and start the show and play for 30 minutes. And then we would back him for an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah. Well, our very first show, we came out. The audience took one listen to some of our first song. And they booed us so loud oh, wow. that me and the banjo player would have a look we'd give to each other. Go, all right. And... Um, <laughs> Let me put it this way. They booed us for 30 minutes, so we played 45. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you 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 gonna, uh, you're not going to make us leave here with our tail <laughs> between our legs. So uh, we, yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> we, we always took it more of a challenge. Well, then we'll just, uh, if they're going to boo. But, the, you know, that that didn't ever occur very much, but it hasn't happened. And so... I don't remember. I don't remember the name of the venue, so I couldn't blame it on the room itself. Um, just people in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> that <Yeah. night. laughs> How long did it take y'all to really come into your own when y'all were playing with uh, that band? Well, for the I mean, audience to start accepting you. We we were accepted fairly quickly. I mean, we were always the the group uh, known for for pressing uh, pressing the limits of bluegrass style music to the point where we changed it so much, people started calling the kind of bluegrass that we played new grass named after our band, new grass revival. And now it's actually, so it's incredibly hard for me to believe that, you know, when I started playing Manlin for a living, I was 18 years old and uh, I'm now 71. So I've been doing it all these years and these, uh, in the early days, sure, you, you, there was met with some resistance, but uh, that's just part of any kind of different kind of music. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, you might be met with some resistance. Yeah, but the musicians knew that we could play, and and uh, we were we were accepted always by the musicians and and most of the audience. You know, just yeah, yeah, sure. There'd be a few rednecks that didn't like our our, our hippie looks and what have you, but. Uh, 
we weren't that different than other people our age at that time. You know? Yeah. Um, to kind of go back to your younger days, did the educators at your high school encourage you to pursue music as a career or did they try to dissuade you from it? Uh, I'm, I don't think it, at that time there, there wasn't as much great activities for youth as far as, in other words, the only, the only thing, I mean, our band director, Mr. Mills, he, he actually had a music appreciation class and that class also encouraged me to want to play music for a living because Mr. Mills talked about all kinds of music, uh, mainly yeah. classical, but he was, a, but he was a hip enough guy in, in the late sixties that he was telling us, well, there's the three B's, uh, Brahms, Bach and Beethoven. And now there's going to be a fourth. It's going to be Beatles. Hmm. And, and he said, my classical friends don't believe me, but it's true. And so uh, that being said, uh, they, they, he was he was kind of pushing us to think in our minds, to open our minds more to, to different types of types of stuff, um, for sure. Yeah. Um, what music, when you were younger, inspired you besides bluegrass? Because 60s and 70s, that's my favorite type of music, yeah. my favorite era of music. Um, was there any sp- specific bands or groups that really – no, turned you well, on. Well, yeah, I mean, but mine, mine was a very mixed bag because I was influenced by a lot of. I was just a sponge for different types of music, and you heard a lot more of it back then, intermingled different types. Mm-hmm. Right. So, of course, I had my bluegrass influences, which was Bill Monroe. My first, my main mandolin influences were Bill Monroe, and then the great Jethro Burns, who was a a jazz mandolin player that was part of a comedy duo named Homer and Jethro. And they wrote, they did the silliest, dumbest songs, but they could both play beautifully guitar and mandolin. But at any rate, uh, so from, you know, the, in the world of bluegrass, <laughs> I had the, the, the Dillards, the country gentlemen, the Osborne brothers and Jim and Jesse and Bill yeah. Monroe and Flatten Scruggs and all those guys. But, but I, and, and I grew up, of course, as a uh, person that could listen to the Grand Ole Opry and watch it on TV. So I, so I grew up, you know, I was, I was hearing uh, Porter Wagner and, and, and Dolly Parton and, and uh, right. a group called the Wilburn Brothers, Bill Anderson, Ernest Tubb, uh, and, but the Grand Ole Opry members. And at the same time, again, I was just such a sponge for all music. So... Uh, my favorite rock band was a band called the Jefferson Airplane from San Francisco, uh, but I was, but I've I've been listening to Eric Clapton since I was in high school. Yeah. So Eric Clapton was in the Cream when I was in high school, and the Cream was the greatest. Jimi Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix, Cream, Eric Clapton, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. Still got the Rolling Stones. I just bought their new album recently. So that's pretty yeah. great that I that I've gotten to listen to some of my favorite musicians all this time. Um, have you ever so had I, a chance? To, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. Have you ever had the chance to meet one of those people in real life, or yes. to even play with them? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, in um, uh, one time, I was in. Uh, I was asked to be part of some Nashville musicians when Ringo Starr's All Star Band came to Nashville. To so I got to, I got to play with a little help from my friends uh, with Ringo on stage, and that was <laughs> yeah. it was very surreal because I didn't yeah. get to. Meet I didn't get to meet him before the show, and I'm standing there. Oh, playing. wow. Up, up, he comes this close and says, hi, thanks for playing. And I did get to meet him after the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in another situation, um, I've been fortunate to be in all kinds of kinds of yep. music and situations. And uh, enough of, of a musician to also be included in, 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 in backup groups sometimes for people, too. So I was in a backup group. It was for the, uh, I think it was a tribute to Merle Haggard at the hockey okay. arena in Nashville. And so there was a large variety of people, including like, you know, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top and, and uh, but country singers of the day and Loretta Lynn was on it. And uh, so I'm in a backup band and one of the people, oh, well, well, Willie Nelson was on it. And so we backed all these different performers and one of the people we backed was in fact Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. So I got wow. to I got, I got to talk to Keith for a few minutes and uh, explain to him that uh, I was also uh, to, took journalism in high school. So I was like uh, uh, one of the people that put together the school newspaper. Uh, 
And I found, and I found out the hard way that you don't go putting an ad for the Rolling Stones fan club on the back of the school newspaper. <laughs> yeah. As I did. <laughs> Oops. Their, their album, Let it, Let it Bleed, had come out, and I yeah. bought Let It Bleed. And in, there was an insert that says, are you a member of the Rolling Stones fan club? And it had a picture mm -hmm. of the Stones. So I just stuck it on the back of the school newspaper. And boy, when that paper came out, all of a sudden it called over the loud system, Sam Bush, please report to the front <laughs> <of those> office. <laughs> ah, so I got to tell Keith that I almost got kicked out of school because of the Rolling Stones. <laughs> it's a pretty awesome story. Were you scared when you first left school, just trying to make your way in the world? Did that frighten you or, or were you really no, excited? No. Well, what, and I was, uh, I was, when I was a senior in high school, after being a junior national called, I was called the national junior fiddle champion for three years. The contest is in Weezer, Weezer Idaho. At any rate, uh, I took violin lessons from the professor at Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green for my senior year. I took lessons from a professor named Betty Pease, and Mrs. Pease was really a really strict teacher. And um, so she was, uh, I went from being a fiddle champ to a beginning violinist with her. So uh, so she uh, was going to help me uh, go to Western at, uh, with a violin scholarship. But right about two weeks before I uh, was to register for college, uh, some guys came down from Louisville in a bluegrass band and I was working five, you know, I was going to be working my way through college at, at, as a busboy at the Holiday Inn there in Bowling Green. And so I was working at the Holiday Inn and uh, all of a sudden these two guys walked in that offered me a job to move to Louisville and play five nights a week. And I decided mm -hmm. that's yeah. what I wanted to yeah. do. So I was, I'd, <laughs> I'd already broken enough dishes and uh, at the, at the <laughs> Holiday Inn to know that I better go play music somewhere. Yeah. Was that scary or did you have some yeah i didn't back from your peers to no no it wasn't scary at all from not really i mean because the, it, the music kind of led me there right and, uh yeah. plus uh the people that asked me to join their band i mean one i know i had known them for a a, a, a while a, a while okay. and uh one of the one of the guys in the band was in fact who had helped me you know take took me out to idaho to the fiddle contest when i was a kid all the way from kentucky right. so uh i was i was joining up with some friends and i felt i guess i felt kind of protected in that band looking back yeah. Yeah. uh so no, no, it was too. It, I was too excited about yeah. to get out and uh, everything on my own. You know, finally I'm out on my own and I get to play music all I want. And, uh, yeah. and and the first couple of years I was out of high school, I played music all I want to the point. I actually ran myself into a state of exhaustion because I was just uh, if there was a jam session, I wanted to be in it, and uh, and I didn't rest a lot. And I found out when I literally went in had went into a kind of a little exhaustion. <laughs> exhaustion state where a, a doctor oh, yeah. uh, you you have to sleep I went, oh okay. <laughs> oh right did you well, ever did you get the chance to continue with violin after you left and joined the I, band? I i didn't continue the style of a violinist i i still play it but you know, the, the fiddle, fiddle is like you know your folk country way to play the fiddle and you learn that by ear as well you don't learn that by reading music per se so i was already a fiddle player and then I went to, I tried the violin side of life for a year. And, uh, but just to find out that, uh, no, well, I've always played the mandolin more than fiddle anyway. So I, okay. once I, when I moved to Louisville, I started playing my mandolin for a living. And, but within a couple of years, I was back to where I was the fiddle player in the band too. So both mandolin and fiddle. So I still play the fiddle and I, and I still like to do it. Um, at what age did, did, did you start writing your own music? Uh, probably there? around uh, in high school, started okay. making up tunes in high school, and and then it even got to be a challenge to make them up. If I wrote them out in musical notation, sitting in class while I was obviously supposed to be studying something else, but uh, but I'd, I'd write see if I could write them out in musical notation and just as a challenge to exercise my brain and what have you. So started making up some tunes probably by about seventeen years old. Probably. When you're uh, when you're writing music, do you try to convey an emotion when you start out, or do you want to tell a story? I well, I tend to come more from the instrumental performer that mm -hmm. uh, 
in the world of bluegrass or country, it's kind of like you do it because it feels good. And uh, um, especially Southern people. And so I, uh, I, I guess just going around things that make me kind of feel something. It's hard to explain because I, yeah. uh, I don't really have a plan and I'm, I'm not always the, the fastest of composers. It takes me a while to get a tune I like. Mm -hmm. Have you ever decided to perform a tune and then decide that you didn't like it after performing it and you wanted to swap things around or just maybe discard it yep. completely? Yeah. Yes. Is that yeah. is that challenging mentally to deal with having performed something and put so much effort into it and not liking it? Uh, it's, or is it's, it just kind of part of the process? It's kind of part of the process and it's pretty obvious to you when something's not working. But, but really... Uh, getting out and doing it in front of people that kind of is a a barometer of well it's going to fly right yeah. okay um as you were starting your career as a musician uh, did you ever want to settle down in the future start a family or did you just want to play and have uh success in that in that room well uh it, <laughs> I mean, I was settled down. I've always been settled down. I'm just, uh, in a way, in that um, I got married to uh, first wife uh, right at age 18. Okay. And, and, I, and we just thought that would be the easiest thing to do. And then 11 years later, we it, it didn't prove out. But, right. uh, but Lynn and I uh, have now been married unbelievably 39 years yeah. and so Lynn you know knew when falling in love with and marrying a musician that this is what I do and yeah. travel is part of what I do now Lynn and I work together we're we're unique in that way uh there's like a whole lot of couples you know don't or can't work together um mm -hmm. and and now Lynn became uh got interested in money management and so Lynn became mm -hmm. the accountant became an accountant, a CPA. And, um, and so we, we are able to work together. Lynn is the business manager for our, for the band, the Sam Bush band when we're on the road and that's a total full-time job. So the two of us yeah. together, we, we work together. And so Lynn travels about half the time. So she knows exactly what we all go through because she goes through it too. And so we, uh, are fortunate that we work well together and yeah. uh, we, we work hard and we play hard. So uh, right now we're in a, a time at, uh, in Florida that we get to regroup at the end of each year and I'll be hitting it hard again by on come January 6th. Wow, pretty soon. When you're traveling, do you usually ride in a camper van type setup or maybe an RV? You always like, hear about life on the road. Yeah, from long road trips. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Well, I've done, I've done it in many different ways. And for the, you know, when I first got out of high school, you, you drove yourself and and you have uh, hundreds of miles and you know, in a car, five of you are um, with a bass fiddle somehow stuffed in there with you. And, um, <laughs> But uh, as as we travel now, it's either we we will either uh, traveling by tour bus is the preferred way to travel, yeah, for a couple of reasons. Yeah. One, it's you actually get more rest that way, and mm -hmm. two, we are able to bring all our own equipment, and it's yeah. you know you, uh, you you wouldn't think it would make that much difference, but but you know a drummer, our, Chris, our drummer, can certainly enjoy playing his own instruments. Cause I get to, right. Um, but when we fly or, or we either travel by tour bus or we fly and then you are sub either supplied ground transportation by the concert buyer, or you have rented a van where you need, might need to go a couple hours from the airport somewhere when you're, you know, you certain that that's common too to fly to a, an airport city and then drive a couple hours, especially when like, for instance, you're the mountains of Colorado, you fly right. to fly to Denver and drive a few hours make yeah. a little circuit out of play in certain mountain communities, play four or five of those, and then come back and fly home back to Nashville. So basically by tour bus or flying and vanning. Have you ever played at Red Rock before? Yes. I saw uh, Sierra Farrell this summer or this fall at Red Rock. 
and it was a beautiful venue. I, I loved it, and that was a good show as well. Oh, it, it, uh, yeah. Well, you know, Red Rocks is like uh, that's one of the most beautiful concert. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're one of the greatest uh, ones that's ever came from Red Rocks was Neil Young playing there, and a, a monsoon rain hit while he's playing. You just look at <laughs> look it up on YouTube. Okay. I mean, he's playing an absolute drenching rain. Yeah, and I guess because he's he wasn't plugged into an amplifier, it's a wireless rig that he had. He could continue to play as long as it's not lightning. You can play if lightning's striking. Yeah. Everybody's got to got to get out of the way. Yeah. Have you ever had to play in downpour like that, or I guess due to the type of sure, okay. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah. Is it is well, it challenging? Yeah. Uh, I imagine it will be. Well, I imagine we, you'd have to if to protect your instruments. Absolutely, we the performers yeah. uh, are protected from rain. But again, okay. but if it starts lightning, you got every, we all have to stop. Nobody right. wants to electrocuted just because you wanted to hear some music. Right? Yeah. <laughs> music, music can wait. Yeah. It can come back. Uh, but yeah, the, it's, but Red Rock and that with the Neil Young at Red Rocks uh, rainstorm. Yes. That's it's it's amazing because he keeps playing yeah. it really good. <laughs> but our our instruments, I, 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 my old mandolin was made in 1937, and if it got wet like that, I, it would be ruined forever. Right. So no, no, those have to be solid body electric instruments to get wet. Yeah, it might work yeah. again. And even at that, you're endangering your electronic parts. Right. Yeah. So you've talked about your work with bands when did you start to kind of separate and go off on your own to start the sam bush band uh and start playing more solo 1996 started up under calling it calling them my name uh mm -hmm. got out of high school i was in the band new grass revival for 18 years when we broke up um our last job was opening for the grateful dead on new year's eve 1989 so we didn't make it into the 90s and then in 1990, I started playing with a singer, thought of as a country singer, Emmy Lou Harris. I played with Emmy Lou for five years in her band. And then I kind of freelanced around here and there. I played some with Lyle Lovett, uh, played some with Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Bela and I were in Newgrass Revival together as well for yeah. the last nine years. And um, but around 1996, I felt that it was, you know, I was ready to start uh, going back to making. You know, playing tunes I wrote and sing, and uh, mm -hmm. and so started with what we called the Sam Bush Band in 1996, and still going, still going. That's right. They're still working. You've been, <laughs> you've been nominated for I think 14 Grammys. When when was your first Grammy win? You was uh, the, it a solo or was it? Uh, no? I I haven't won any solo, uh, but I've won three, and as part of ensembles. And the first one was as a member of Emmy Lou Harris's band, the Nash Ramblers. And Emmy cut a live record called Emmy Lou Harris and the Nash Ramblers live at the Ryman, our famous auditorium in Nashville. And it won best country group or vocal, best vocal group, country best vocal group. The next one was uh, the year of 90. Six, I played with the Fleck Tones a number of shows, mm -hmm. and a live record was recorded with that. So that, uh, so I got to be as a member of the Fleck Tones a Grammy uh, for best pop instrumental. So got one for vocals, one for instrumental, and then the third Grammy was uh, because I played on the Oh Brother Where Art Thou soundtrack. That's a great movie, and it yeah. it won Record of the Year, and so. Mm -hmm. It's, Can you uh, talk about working on A Brother Where Art Thou? Well, Luke I, loves that movie. For, I love that movie. So yeah, cool. well, I was there for a couple of days working on music at a studio in Nashville, the music part. And I now know that uh, for, for movies and what have you, there's a lot of music recorded that yeah. isn't used. So there, were, I, pl I played on two or three different versions of Man of Constant Sorrow that wasn't used. And they were trying to get it where George Clooney could sing it himself. He wanted to actually sing it. And so that's why it's actually in the key it was in. And Dan Tominsky, who did sing it, uh, mm -hmm. Constant Sorrow, who sang that song, uh, um, we, we recorded it in different ways and maybe different keys for George Clooney, what have you. And then they finally realized, no, they just need to have him lip sync it with Dan's, because Dan sang it so beautifully. And uh, so it was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, be it, but you know, again, you're, you're you you play on a lot of music on a soundtrack yeah. that is, that isn't used. Yeah, right. And there, so, you, so you played 
on it. Amen. Uh, amen. Of constant sorrow for that album. For that, I played on a version of it that wasn't used. Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. The, yeah. What I am on the record of the soundtrack record. I'm, I play mandolin on. He's he's in the jailhouse now. Okay. So yeah, that, but uh, I love that movie in the way that yeah. the music is really one of the stories is the music. Mm -hmm. Pretty. <clears throat> Was that the only movie soundtrack you ever participated in, or did you just? Uh, no, <laughs> no, I was. Uh, they made a movie about uh, uh, somewhere in the nineties. Uh, they made a remake of the Beverly Hillbillies uh, with Jim Varney playing Jed Clampett. So that was in the Beverly Hillbillies soundtrack movie. There's a, a, a Fox and the Hound Part Two the Disney movie I've played in. I haven't really played on a lot of soundtracks because the, uh, soundtracks are. Basically, a lot of them are, you know, uh, recorded in, in uh, Los Angeles or New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, for na now, the what when when there was an ABC television show called Nashville, mm -hmm. I played quite a few of the Nashville songs that would be recorded and and played the part on camera of one of the actors, fiddle players, uh, of a, a character named Deacon. I was Deacon's fiddle player. Somebody goes, yeah, I can, I can see, uh, I can see your right hand. I knew it was you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we got on camera. So when you're when you are nominated for a Grammy, especially earlier on, were you just happy to be there, or did you really, you know, want to win? Well, of course, I guess you, you always want to win. But, well, yeah, I mean, you want, yeah. you, want to you win expect it. to. But to get to be one of the five finalists of, out of all the people, you know, that could happen in each category, that's pretty overwhelming because Grammys are all encompassing. It's all music, all types of music. And one of the things I love about the Grammys is that the, uh, you know, their, their section, there's, there's probably types of music maybe you don't care for, maybe you don't know much about. But guess what? Their trophy counts just as much yeah. as all the, as all the rock and roll trophies. It's the same trophy. So the polka yeah. guy, the Grammy for the best polka album, is just as important as anybody else's Grammy, and that's what I love about them. They that they 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 respect and represent all styles of music. So that part I really love, and uh, and of course there's only about I think twelve. Grammy Awards given out on the TV broadcast, and all the rest of us are in are what is called the pre-telecast awards. So almost all country or bluegrass, classical, jazz, I mean, everything that isn't just the current TV trend of music. Yeah, right. So you're going to, uh, you're going to, therefore, what's on the Grammy Awards is a lot more, you know, you think of them as, uh, uh, song and dance routines. There's a lot of dances and fireworks, yeah. light shows and stuff. And it makes great TV. And, uh, but, uh, so uh, yeah, gosh, there's like 160 something awards that, that are given that aren't yeah, the ones that you see yeah. on, on TV. So yeah. it's a fun TV show, but, uh, still, but I'm still excited to be a nominee because it's been years since I was one. Yeah. And, uh, is and it we, Radio it, John you're nominated for this year? It is. Yes. So it's, it's nominated for the Bluegrass album. So so I have a one in six chance of winning. So that's cool. And uh, and, and people that are nominated are my friends. And, and we all are going to, most of us are going to go. So we'll see each other. And, and, and I get, and you know, Lynn and I get in free. So it's great. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk but, a, yeah. a little bit about Radio John? John Hartford? No. Yeah. Well, Radio John is, in fact, yes, named after. It was... Uh, an album is called Radio John, the songs of John Hartford. And uh, mm -hmm. there's 10 tunes on it. Nine of the 10 songs were written by John Hartford, who was a friend of mine and a, and a, and a big brother style person and a mentor. And, and then he influenced me and he, and he helped me along the way for sure. And gave me advice and, and uh, most of which I took. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, but John was a uh, par excellence songwriter from in nashville in the 60s then in the uh, late 60s he moved out to la and people started seeing him on the glenn campbell show where he wrote a song that was a hit for glenn called gentle on my mind and gentle on my mind was at one point held the guinness book of world records for the most people recording it 
<laughs> and um, so, at any rate, John. But John was a great musician, fiddle fiddler, banjo picker, guitar player, great singer, yeah. great songwriter. He learned to dance. He was a Renaissance style man. He learned to. Mm -hmm. He he became a steamboat captain. He worked on steamboats oh, wow. as a kid, and was always interested in that. Growing up around St. Louis, <laughs> but he. Uh, became a steamboat captain. I said, well, gosh, what all does that entail? He said, well, for starters, you have to be able to map out the entire Mississippi River on paper. Wow. Yeah. And that's pretty amazing for me to think of. And I got to ride with him once on a steamboat. He was a pilot outside of Peoria, Illinois, on a boat called the Julia Bell Swain that's mentioned in the song Radio John. Okay. So the nine out of ten tunes are written by John, and the song Radio John itself is written by me and a friend named John Pinnell, and Pinnell grew up around Illinois, is from Illinois, so he was very aware of Hartford. And we tried to just uh, include in, in the song about John, the Radio John song, things that John was good at and because and, and he was so good at so many things. He even got to where he, handwriting, he was like a chant, most beautiful calligraphy style handwriting. One day he said, I decided I was going to learn to write that way. And, or one day he said, I decided well, I'm going to learn to dance while I play the fiddle and banjo. And, and he did it. And, you know, it's just, so at any rate, he was incredibly talented and a loving tribute to my friend, John. John died back in around the year 2000. And uh, I just uh, just started singing my favorite Hartford songs, and before I knew it, I was laying them down on on recording devices, and uh, ended up playing all the instruments myself on that record, except for the song Radio John. So I'm glad I've tried it one time to play all the instruments myself, uh, because it, for me, it's not as near as joyful as playing with others. That's the that's the joyful part of music: the yeah. communication with other people. Yeah. Can you talk a, a little bit about the song Tall Buildings? Because <laughs> that's one of my favorite songs that you've played. Yes, we talked about it a lot. I love the story behind it, too. Well, John, uh, that, that one he wrote, <clears throat> Hartford wrote that song in the 60s. And uh, it was on one of the early John Hartford albums that I would buy and, and admire as a boy as when I was a teenager. And uh, so he re-recorded some of his songs in the 70s. And, and uh, by now, I was playing with him on records. So that song, Tall Buildings, I got to record with John in, in about, I'm guessing, somewhere around 75, 76, somewhere in there. And uh, I played and sang on, on the, his newer version of In Tall Buildings. And I just always really loved that song and what it said. It's almost almost about me, the country boy. You know, I I haven't, I didn't. I didn't have to cut my hair, but I certainly do. Uh, but I certainly go to meeting, you know, I, I don't work in tall buildings for a living, but I do go to them yeah. for meetings. And it's part of, you know, I go to tall buildings figuratively and, and actually, you know, literally I, I go, I go to the tall buildings to do music business. And, uh, yeah, yeah. uh but that one is more, I, I think of it more as a, as a person that went to New York to have to go. Yeah. To ride it the almost, side. It has a good, um, a really strong melancholic feel to get back yeah. to the flowers and, and get back to you. And I've always just, I just really connected with that song. I thought it was really yeah, beautiful. The music fits those words too, as far as the yeah. melancholic yeah. feeling you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, your other album, Circles Around Me, is also really good. Um, can you talk about the song Circles Around Me and kind of why you named the album off of that song? Yeah, uh, that was co-written. I wrote co-wrote that with a friend named Jeff Black, and Jeff is a marvelous songwriter. And uh, I, uh, as a songwriter, it, I'm much better if I can collaborate with someone. And and uh, but Jeff and I wrote that when it, we we you know when we first get together to write, we just talk. We talk about things and what's important to us, what has made an impact on us lately, and what have you. And the song circles around me. Um, it's about it's. It's kind of a song of thanks, and and you'll hear the phrase "I'm thankful for all the good friends that I found," and nothing pointed that out more. Now the song had already been written ten years before that, but the 2020 lockdown pandemic mm -hmm. is that as we were missing our friends and you couldn't we couldn't congregate and. Uh, it just as as we then when we got to start playing again, 
that song took on a whole different meaning for me. You know, when I think of, when I thought I would be standing there on stage, literally saying, and to thank you for all the good friends that I've found because, you know, people that come and, and pay it, pay for the price of a ticket, uh, uh, to come in and help us earn a living. You're being our friend. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I know you probably, you probably like all of your songs, but which song of yours do you have a feeling of attachment to the most? Do you feel most attached to? Circles. Circles, circles. around me is one. There's another one called Transcendental, uh, Transcendental Meditation Blues that Jeff and I wrote that one too, Jeff Black. Uh, it, it's not about Transcendental Meditation what it is, uh, is uh, when Lynn and I were young and, and just dating, it was the summer of 78, and the, I lived down in the country in Kentucky, and she lived up in Louisville, and the transmission was out on my car all summer. <laughs> Didn't have the money to get, so uh, I uh, I would drive the Greyhound up to uh, to Louisville to visit Lynn, and she'd pick me up at the Greyhound bus station. It was about a two and a half hour bus ride. Yeah. And uh, the 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 way Jeff and I write it never really states the obvious, but what that song is about is literally me, my, my journey on the Greyhound bus to try to get to Louisville to see this newfound love of mine that now we've been married 39 years. <laughs> <laughs> that's impressive. That's congratulations. Um, as we're wrapping yeah, that, up yeah, here, that's kind of like 39 years married to a mandolin player. That's like, you know, it's like dog years. It's like 75 in real people's life. You know? <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Well, as we're wrapping up here, we have a series of questions that we ask every interviewee, and I'll let Luke go first. Well, I have a few this time, actually. Is this a lightning round? Oh, something <laughs> like that, yeah. A lightning round. <laughs> um, where do you see the bluegrass genre going in the next few years? Well, hard to know, but uh, I, it's going well, I'll tell you that, mm -hmm. because we have such good young players that are setting the trends now, and the the the, the maybe the four that come to mind like right off the bat are, are, are Chris Dooley, uh, Sierra Hull, Molly Tuttle, and Billy Strings that are, you know, a lot of people are hearing these people play and they're hearing wonderful musicianship when you hear any people. And, uh, and, and I'm really, really happy for Billy because Billy's Billy strings drawing a large audience out there. And I believe Billy is turning people on a lot of people that haven't maybe heard these instruments played, certainly not in this way before that Billy, uh, you know, people are, he, he's turning people on that may he's, not have seen people yeah. play these kind of instruments before. And certainly not in the, in the progressive way he, Billy can play. He's, so he's really good. He is good. One of his songs right now in the morning light is one of my favorites. This year, yeah. he's a so he's knowing that, that you right off the bat that that's and that's just four people. There are right. loads of good young musicians now that so bluegrass is in great hands, and at this moment, I lo I think it's in a great situation because you still have a person that I consider a first generation bluegrasser is Del McCurry. You still have Del McCurry doing it, and uh, and I'm kind of second generation, so uh, now there's. A, <laughs> I mean, heck, a lot of the second generation are getting too old to pick now. So, the, but the young, there, there's great young musicians coming up, and it's and it's and it's very positive, yeah. right? Dale McCurry, I think he was on NPR. That you know that little like tiny room they have where they have everybody coming oh, and play. Tiny desk, like, yeah. Tiny desk, yeah. I heard him on there. Yeah, you're often called the father of progressive bluegrass. Can you kind of explain what progressive bluegrass is? In a nutshell, really. It's just that you play uh, what I call you play contemporary music on traditional bluegrass instruments, and by contemporary music, I mean you 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 you're writing and and and, and playing your own tunes and and having influences outside, you know all the influences all you know you're influenced by everything country bluegrass country bluegrass jazz rock folk everything uh, everything classical absolutely absolutely. So it's yeah. so it's really contemporary music played and sung on con traditional bluegrass instruments. Do you want to plug anything? What music are you working on right now or in the future? Anything you're excited about? <laughs> you might not be able to tell us. But, I'm yeah, excited about after getting up in the morning. Are you kidding? Uh, but yeah. uh, well, as I told you, Lynn and I are in Florida as you and I are, as we talk, and uh, 
we come down, I bring instruments with me and I make up tunes or, or, uh, or, or try to make uh, record little versions myself on a little small recorder, digital, uh, record versions myself that maybe I want to show, get a, get an idea of what I have kind of yeah. like it sound and then show it to my band. Yeah. So, uh, nothing, nothing specific that I'm working on right now, but you know, the, the year's coming up and, uh, 2024 is about to happen and I'm getting a couple of days. Nothing, nothing weird happens. I'll be at Telluride Bluegrass Festival in Colorado for what will be my fiftieth, unbelievably fiftieth consecutive year wow. to play. That's but amazing. That that I got to go to all of them. That's that's amazing. And that yeah. they got to keep having this festival all those years. That's amazing. Yeah, that's yes. awesome. As we are wrapping up now, we yes. always have two questions we ask every everyone that we interview. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, what is your advice for young people just making their way in the world? Well, in any, you know, with whatever your uh, passion is, be it maybe you have a passion for writing or song or dance or playing an instrument or baseball or, you know, a, a passion for accounting, a passion for just, you know, but it, um, I guess I can think of it as, as far as giving people musical advice uh, in the field I've gone in, which is try to remember what, as, as you keep going through it, if you decide you want to make your living doing this, well, that's a whole different ball of wax. You know, I know a lot of great musicians that didn't want to do this for a living because you don't want to go through this lifestyle or because I got a feeling that uh, playing music, it can be likened a lot to uh, hitting a baseball you know, if, if you get a hit three out of 10 times in your life hitting a baseball, you may make the Hall of Fame. So it's a game of failure, right? So the music business can, can sort of be a game of failure, I guess. It, but I, I tend to think of it as the, the, the long run. It, it, it's a marathon, not a, not a sprint. So I've been, yeah. I've been doing this a long time. And I hope to, I really hope to keep doing it for a long time. Uh, and that, that depends on, you know, does your voice work You're still here? How's your hands? And uh, things I didn't have to think about 40 years ago, but now yeah. they're, they're reality. But yeah. it's, um, I, you know, I'm pretty encouraged. And our next question is a bit of a doozy. We ask everyone this mm -hmm. and we've had some really interesting answers. Yeah, the answers always really show the person, the true person of a character. And that is, what is the meaning of life to you personally? The meaning of life. Yeah, it's a bit abstract. You don't, but... you don't want to know much, do you? Uh, the, the, <laughs> uh, well, okay. the meaning of life is kind of like this. I've had I've had occasions to, um, you know, uh, people know I've had a varied uh, medical things happen to me in my life as a cancer survivor of a few times. And um, anytime I would go into, uh, you got to always have a little talk with yourself before you're sedated because you might not wake up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's kind of three things I think about, and I've thought about it a lot, uh, and but not just at that moment. I think about it, which is, do you love? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I love a lot of people. I very much love my wife, and I'm very fortunate in that way. Two, uh, are you loved? Do you feel loved? Yes, I do. I'm fortunate in that way. And three, uh, are you okay with what you've done with your life? Yeah, I am. So in that way, th that's the meaning of life, the love and and feeling that I've um, been true to myself. And so being true to yourself and feeling the love and giving it, that's it. All right. That's beautiful. Thank you. For well, thank you, sir. Uh, that was beautiful. That was awesome. We, uh, we really appreciate We really appreciate you coming on today. It's an honor for both of us. Yes. And uh, this is Mr. Well, Sam Bush. Well, I appreciate you guys for having me on. Thank you.